is again, Centered Government Operations, we're back. Now we are looking at um, S-171, which is the creation of a state code of ethics. Um, and I think that um, the way it makes sense for us to do this right now is to kind of go through the bill, just um, <clears throat> look, we'll just go page by page. We, so for those of you who aren't with us all the time, um, we have a kind of a tradition of doing this so that we look at <clears throat> like section one, we'll look at the definitions and if there's anything where we need to put a hold for more discussion, we'll just put a hold. Otherwise, it, we're done with it. So um, just so that we don't keep going back over the same um, territory over and over again, because that uh, we as legislators have the ability to keep um, <clears throat> like cows um, rechewing and swallowing and rechewing again. I think they do it seven times, if I'm not mistaken. So those, the two of you on agriculture should know that, right? They, well, that's chew and they, swallow, have... they chew and swallow their cud. I think it's seven times. That's because they have and so many stomachs. Anthony, you were, you were testifying on that the other day, weren't you? Yeah, we're doing this. We're having a study done, actually, because there's, there's some controversy about how many times it actually is. So <laughs> A&R and, A and R and the Agency of Agriculture can't agree. Ah, yeah, perfect. And does the number of times they chew and swallow have anything to do with the methane emissions? Well, that's part of what we're going to find out. Ah. That's probably why this they're task force. <laughs> okay. Good answer. Enough of that. Thank you very much. So uh, let's then just take out 171 and look at is there any issue on page one that we need to further address? I think the only change is the confidential information and I <coughs> that's been put in there and that isn't a new definition. It's page All one, right. is, good, is good to go. Okay, hearing none. Um, page two, is there anything on there that we would like to address? I have a couple, but if anybody has any? We've heard to some issues around the conflict of interest definition. Right. Yes. I think that was on our list. Okay. And I would look at, I would actually like to look again at line 16. And gift. Is yeah. that gift? Yeah. 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 Okay. How about um, page three? Oh, okay. We're just going to keep going and identify. So we're going to. What? Okay, I see, I see what you're doing. But I wanna go through and get rid of the things that we don't need to ever talk about again. Flag the things that we want to have further discussion on and then we'll have, go back and have the further discussion. Okay, so page three. Did we come to a conclusion about immediate family? I have flagged that. Okay, yeah. yep. Page four. I know that uh, Senator Clarkson brought up the- uh, oh, Sorry, I haven't gotten the page for yet. Yeah, persons. Well, I, um, and I don't know if Amarin did or not. I went through and looked at every place where person is used and where it should be changed to individual that I thought and where it should remain person. So um, we could go through that um, at some point. Yeah, I'd like, I'd love to do that. Okay. So page five. <clears throat> Wait a minute. Oh, I'm just cruising through four. You're moving. That's the advantage of printing them out. <laughs> yeah. And I stupidly don't haven't printed this out. So I should have. Well, page five is where the general assembly comes up. The question about general assembly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and where the code of ethics applies, you mean? 
Yeah, whether the General Assembly is excluded. Right. It's, I would say the, the exclusions are a whole area for us, for obvious. Uh, so I would like to uh, further understand lines 11 through 14. On page five? Yes. Yeah, and then number, number three, and then starting on page fifteen. I mean, line fifteen. I was say. Right. I also, I think, would like us to look on page five. I mean, sorry, I'm sorry, line five about the. And have and a little more discussion on state boards and commissions. Yeah. What that means. Important. And, and yes. Okay, page six. Well, yeah, the interplay with the state boards and commissions and uh, with conflicts and interests is, <laughs> is, is possibly a big one. Yes, that's why we're flagging it. Yeah. But we're just flagging now. Now we're not addressing them. Okay, page six. I would like us to address conflict of interest. Yeah. Yep. Okay. <clears throat> and the whole page six and seven are conflict of interest, I think, down to line 13. Okay, page eight, anybody? There's somebody, something's going off, like. I, I, yeah, that's me. Oh, I, that's In you. order for me to, to leave my um, microphone on, that's the house um, bell. Yes, I can hear it. It's very interesting. That I thought they were all remote for the house meeting. Oh, I, no, I don't they're. Know what's going on. I'm no. having trouble just keeping our things separate. So they're um, hybrid. I, I, I don't. No, no. The how the floor with... action is uh, remote. Okay. I don't have any problem with anything on page eight. I don't either. Uh, apparent. Okay. Well. What? A, anyway, I, I have to reread. I have to look at it more, more closely. Appearance is always. It, that that is connected to conflict of interest. It's the appearance yeah. of conflict of interest. So they were going to talk about the whole conflict of interest. Exactly. Great. Okay. Good. All right. Page nine. Gifts. Yes. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. Not we get it. I mean, we don't get any. You no. Know, no. It's. I think it, we can go through this pretty quickly once we start. Okay. Yeah. And page ten is gifts exceptions. I, we can talk about that under gifts. Page 11. Uh, event attendant. Mm. That's part of we, gifts, Allison. Yeah, no, no, I know. I'm just looking at right. it. So don't spend time thinking about them until right. we get to them. Employment restrictions. Okay. We okay. did talk about the outside employment, but I'm not sure we ever resolved it, so it's probably still something to apply. Okay. Well, and I think we it bears being reminded what uh, the legislators, what we have to comply with with the post-government employment. Uh, it, it would just be good to be reminded. Of which one? Uh, lines 18. Yeah. 18 and 19. Okay, well, that is current law. I know. I just would like to be reminded because oh. we could be expanding it if we wanted. I mean, it doesn't have to just be what that is. Okay. All, but... All right, we can look at that. Uh, page 12. I don't have any issues with 12. I don't either. Page 13. No issues. <clears throat> and page 14. Same, no issues. 
See, we got through many pages without. That was easy. All in favor? <laughs> so I'm going to committee. I'm going to, um, I don't know how many of you saw and I apologize because apparently I have an inability to create documents that can be um, opened. And now I can't even find the document that I sent you. Um, but I did send out a document and thank goodness Christina was able to somehow get it to people so that they could open it. I don't, I couldn't. Yes, thank you, Christina. You're <laughs> resending it meant that we could access it. <laughs> thank so late you. last night at like 1130 or when you responded at like 10 of 11 and I was printing it out at 1130. <laughs> so one of the things, th this is kind of a very simple thing that that I suggested that um, the, the the 12 points that are um, listed which are the the really the the I'm calling them points because I don't know what else to call them somebody might have a better term they are the kind of nuts of what the code of ethics covers and then there's information under them but it seemed to me as if um, numbers three and four were not their own their own topics they were really part under code of conflict because one I, I mean con uh conflict of interest because one talked about if you recuse yourself after a conflict of interest how you, what you do i mean what you're going to do there conduct after recusal and the other one is the appearance of conflict. So I, I, in my mind, they they all fit in with, um, uh, under the topic conflict of interest, but um, uh, two seemed like it was its own its own point, directing others to to do unethical things. I, I and I don't know. Um, Amran and Christina, you can comment on that. It just seemed to me that if you're taught that the um, conduct after recusal is really part of conflict of interest, it isn't its own point, and nor is the appearance of conflict. It is part of conflict of interest. So I don't know how anybody else feels about that, but that, that's just a simple renumbering. That isn't looking at the content of them or anything. Right. So where are you when the 12 points start? Because I because they start, I mean they're definitions and then where are the where they are you start on page six, yeah, number I, one, thank, conflict thank of interest. That, that's what I'm wondering where you are. Page well, six. Well, they right. they start on yep. page six, conflict yep. of interest. And then number two is directing unethical conflict, which I think is its own its own um, ethical um, issue. But I think con conduct after recusal rightly and um, appearance of unethical conduct really, oh, it's appearance of unethical conduct, not appearance of conflict of interest. Okay, I take that one back then. But I do think the recusal after a conflict is um, belongs under conflict of interest. Which is simply renumbering. It's not getting into the, the um, guts of it at all. It, it's just putting three under the first piece, which is conflict of interest. It's putting yeah. giving it another little woman in it. Yeah, so then you would have, yeah, instead of 12, it. you'd have, a, have 11 points. Yep. Right. Okay. So that, as you can see, was one of my, my suggestions. And then, um, I don't know if, if, Amarin, did you go through and look at the person versus individual? 
Uh, for the record, Amarin Aberjali Legislative Council, no, I have not, but I agree that that is a, a good exercise and I'm happy to do that for the next round. Or if we want to do it now, we can just, I, it takes about f five minutes. Mm. Well, and then Allison, you can be happy about it. Well, maybe, or maybe not. I, 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 okay. okay, let's, so everywhere person is used, when person is used in conflict of interest, whether we use this definition or not, I think we mean individual. Correct. Agreed. Yeah, I, I, um, that, but that goes to the definition of person at the beginning, which is uh, uh, for the purposes of the ethics code, I think a person isn't a business or an organization. It oh. is a person. I think th I thought that our decision was to leave that definition there, but then to change in the places where we mean an individual person, change it to individual, because there are places in here where we do mean organizations and, yep. and um, businesses. But then yep. why don't we call them what they are instead of what they aren't, which is a person? Why don't we then say, call out, any organization or business or association or group. I, I really, I, I think that we, a person is a person, is, is an individual. I'm and not gonna, I don't think we should argue about that. It, in Vermont law, it, a person is considered an organization or a um, whatever it says here. And that is, that is the way person is used. We can change it in here, but I think it would be confusing for people unless they also read the entire definitions when they read the code of, con the code of ethics. If they read it as person, they don't know what the definition of person is for this particular one. So they're gonna go by the state definition of person. So why can't we just say individual when we mean individual that's the way we did it in campaign finance we said individual yep. Fine. i mean i don't know if anybody else agrees with that or not okay. I, I do if you ask somebody on the street when you say person what do you mean i bet yes. you nine times out of ten they would not be confused and they would say oh you're a person they would not point to a church and say, oh, that's a person. They'd say, oh, that's a church. It's an organization. It's an they would not, Allison. But what is the what is the harm of using the term individual when we mean individual person? There's not. I'm thrilled with that. Okay, that's, that's all I'm asking us to do. Right. So we leave the definition of person, and then we look at and any place in conflict of interest, like on pay, line seven. If you look at it. It yeah. should be individual, not person. It's an individual, right? Right, right. And, and whether we use this language or not, it's going to be an individual in the conflict of interest. Right. Okay. When um, I think I picked, caught them all on page four, it wrote. <coughs> Can I just be small point though here before we leave the definition? Yes. I know you're tired of my doing this, but it, when you <laughs> underline it, it means we're defining it anew. At least it strikes. I mean, isn't that why it's underlined, Amron? It's underlined here because it's new in this thing. It isn't new in state law. Got it isn't it. a but new it, definition. But our choice in going forward, do we have to accept the state's definition? I guess my question is, do we have to accept the state's definition of person or can we be defining person for this law for this okay. statute differently so then on page four when we have prohibited source me means any person we would have to say here it means any individual any business any association any political we would have to redefine person there because that's what it means there it does not mean individual right mm. i see what you Cameron. Uh, I just wanted to uh, clarify that the the definition of person that's added into this chapter is not the same exactly the same definition of person that is um, 
within Title I, Chapter 3, Construction of Statutes. What is the definition there? A uh, person shall include any natural person, corporation, municipality, the state of Vermont, or any department, agency, or subdivision of the state, and any partnership, unincorporated association, or other legal entity. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I don't want us to argue about this. This is state law. This is the, the accepted uh, language. If we want to use the definition of person here as individual group, business entity, association, or organization, I'm fine with that. I don't know how others feel. I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. Although it makes me wonder why we don't just use the one that, that Amarin just said. Because I think that the, the state code of ethics does not apply to municipalities and those others. Okay. I think. Well, Amron, looks like you were going to say something, yeah. Amron. Amron. I, I would also say that the under the current definition under Title I of person, it would include the state of Vermont or any department or agency or subdivision, which I don't know okay. that you would necessarily want to include for some of these around prohibitions of gifts and receiving things. If you're if you're a state employee receiving something from another state agency, um, it, it, the definition doesn't work quite right that way. Right. I agree. Great, okay. And so we'll use individual when we mean individual and we'll keep the definition. And so on page four where it says person, we mean person as defined here, I believe. Is that right, Christina and Amarin? Yes. Line six. Line six, yeah. And then it says page, an example, and it says an example in that case, person could be a corporation. Yes. Okay, just to be clear, it's yeah. the definition of person. Right. So on page five, when we use persons under applicability, we mean individuals. It applies to all individuals elected or appointed. Correct. In individuals, oh, yeah. Because you couldn't have a corporation elected to do so. There's where we use individuals. Yep. Okay. Um, in, um, there are a number of cases, uh, places in here where individual is already used. Um, on page seven, on line 14, I think a public servant shall not direct another person. It should be individual, I think. Yeah, because you can't direct a corporation. Yeah. If only we could. Yeah, <laughs> I was going to say, I think Anthony would like to. And on page eight, the appearance of unethical conduct on line five, the perspective of a reasonable individual with knowledge of the relevant facts. Yeah. Right. right. And on preferential treatment, Yep, there, there I don't know if it should be person or individual because I think it says should not give preferential treatment to any person because of the person's wealth, position, or status. That could that could apply to a corporation or an organization. So that should remain right. person, right? Yes. Yep. Line eight and nine. Yep. Okay. Uh, let me see if I found other places. I was just cruising. But you, I, that was still back. What? Oh. I had, you can tell how I had such a titillating evening last night going through looking for a person in here. Um, and Amarin, all Amarin has to do is press a button and all the persons. No, because we don't change all of them. No, no, I'm just saying she has the ability with her program in Ledge Council to just say, show me where person pops up and she just, it just does. And then she had just has to decide whether she should change Egg. it or not. Yes, exactly. Okay. I see what you mean. Line 18 also has person. Yeah, uh, uh, in number seven, misuse of information. I, I think that could be person. I think you're right now that I read it again. Yeah, because it could be financial gain of an organization or a business. Yep. Yeah. Um, that might be the only 
And then on line 20, on, on line 21. Yep. Thanks. Did that I should be that? individual, I think. Uh, on line 21 under misuse of government resources. Yep. See, I, from, I'm not sure well, that would, that might, we might want that to remain person. Yeah, it oh. might be better, yeah. Um, so if anybody else finds any, I didn't, I don't have any others. Maybe I ran out of steam. <laughs> I doubt it. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I think if another per if it pops up, we'll 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 focus on it. But I think we've flogged it pretty fully. Only on line thirteen, line I mean page thirteen, line sixteen. If we put it says in person. If we put a, a um, dash between a hyphen between in and person, it's clear that it's in person. <laughs> we know what right. that means. <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know if anybody else looked at, um, uh, had any time to look at definitions. I did send you uh, the definition of um, immediate family for the UVM Board of Trustees. Um, at the top of the... Right, definition of immediate family from UVM. Mm -hmm. It doesn't go into your grandmother, your in-law, grandmother, and all of those. I thought it was um, a pretty clean definition, but I, I may be wrong. Um, if other people can comment on that, I don't. Well, that's it's better. Uh, did somebody else send ideas about the definition of family? Am I dreaming that? I thought I saw some other definitions floating around the emails. Christina, did you, did you send it? No, okay, maybe I'm wrong. She did send information on um, post-employment or uh, maybe that's what um, I was thinking. Okay. Com competitive jobs, whatever you want, however you want to call that. So outside employment. The phrase and any relative residing in the same household. Um, I guess I'm not clear how wide a universe that could be. Well, I think it means if your um, mother-in-law is living with you, then there probably is, she, she probably would be considered part of your immediate family, but it wouldn't be anybody living in your household because you could have four um, young professionals who rent a house together who are not related in any, okay. any form. So you don't want to have anybody who lives in the same household. I think that's the uh intent there okay but i i don't know tj does that sound i don't have the uvm uh oh definition in front of me so i apologize for that um it says spouse or civil union partner child parent sibling or such relations by marriage or civil union partnership so it'd be parent child or sibling um, by marriage or civil union partnership, person claimed as a dependent for federal income tax purposes and any relative residing in the same household as the trustee. There may be other family members as to whom owed, I don't know what that says, in favor of disclosure. So that sometimes you might, there might be other people that um, you should disclose for, um, but that that's on a case by case basis. Yeah, I think that verb is moved. Moved, <laughs> okay. <laughs> that's, uh, that's consistent with, with how most other states uh, define this. Most of the situations that crop up uh, are in the realm of uh, civil union adjacent type relationships, people who are living together 
um, and whether the code should uh, apply to them, you know, living together in an amorous way. Um, so we did have domestic partner in here, but yeah. it isn't in here. I noticed that. Yeah. I think you might be right. We should add domestic partner. I think I think that's a good. And uh, is there a reason that there were, Christine, who made the choice to make this so expansive? So honestly, that was before my time. So that would be Larry Novins. And I do think that there was some element of being aspirational here. And so, I do concur that it, it could and probably should be more narrow than it's written now. So I'm think not- the was the federal, federal Code of Ethics. I believe that was his original source. And that oh. was where he was looking when he found this definition. And I'm not wedded to the UVM one. I just picked that up because I am a former trustee and we had to sign a, uh, a thing about 40 pages long. <laughs> about this but um so i just went there last night and looked it up allison did you have a comment yeah i i, I don't know how and maybe tj or christina have a, an idea about this but anybody that you know that you're related to that you could make a choice about that would benefit um i mean in uh, a very direct way. I mean, a grandchild, we make decisions about uh, about financing grandchildren's education or whatever. I mean, is there a way that without being so prescriptive that also gets at other family bonds that would benefit that are inappropriate or or is that just way too, I mean, it also benefits everybody else's grandchildren too, some of those some of those. So problems. I think um, the last sentence on the UVM addresses or that. Other but, family members as to whom uh, it. Uh, I don't I know what the verb is. It doesn't I'll, make sense with moved either. I know. Pat had a conflict. Uh, conflict. A comment. Well, they owed. Uh, anyway, to, uh, who had, uh, who would benefit uh, or. Yeah, pass, if we pass. think about that line, that might cover it. It, it says, I, and uh, to whom disclosure should also be made to avoid the right. appearance of conflict. Uh, that's to whom disclosure should also be made in right. favor of. In order to avoid the appearance of conflict. I guess I ran out of typing space or something, but. Pat, did you have a comment? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this is a section that's been bothering me a lot um, only because there are so many ways you can go with this definition. I sent you, and this may be what uh, Senator Polina is referring to, a, a, a um, definition that we used at DMV and I was involved in that discussion and that was years ago, which was interesting because it didn't have domestic partner and the things that, that we now know should be included. Um, my recommendation is, and you mentioned this on page eight, if you included perceived conflict of interest, um, that serves a whole bunch of purposes. It is on many lists. I, I went out and did a Google search and perceived um, conflict of interest is part of several definitions. It not only opens up the door to all the things you were talking about, uh, about the uh, in-laws and about this person and that person, but it also, in my mind, gives a sense of, I don't want to use the word comfort, to the public because it says, maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong, I'm just perceiving this. And it, and it may allow them the comfort of going forward and saying, hey, I think, uh, you know, Pat McDonald shouldn't be voting on this. And I have to tell you a story, um, I'll do it quick. Governor Snell, when I was uh, working for Governor Snelling, I had to talk to him about something I thought might be a conflict of interest for me. And this is what he said to me. He said, if you're asking the question, somebody somewhere will consider it a conflict of interest because they will perceive it to be so. And that's what that's been in my head for 
10 years, 15 years. And that's why this, I think you need to keep it narrow, not as narrow as the DMV thing, because that was a different time because things have changed in, in our relationships, but um, keep, it, keep it simple and add the word, uh, add the words perceived conflict of interest. And I think that will solve your problem. That's just my two cents. Thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate it. Yeah, thanks. And I think the way that last sentence reads, <laughs> the way it really reads, not the way I typed it, is that there may be other family members as to whom disclosure should also be made to avoid the appearance of conflict. Right. So it says there are others that right. in particular situations that you should. And, and people will perceive all sorts of things I have come to find out over my years in state government. And sometimes it's true and sometimes with explanation, it turns out not to be true. So. It opens the door for conversation. So what does anybody think about that definition? Or is it still too broad or still or too narrow? But I think we do need to add domestic partner as um, defined in wherever it's defined. That reference that's in the current I think bill. It's good. I think it's good. Uh, can I ask a question, Madam Chair, about civil? Sure. Civil union partners, is that, that's not something, I know it's it's legal, but it's not something that necessarily we do anymore or. No, but oh, there are I'm, still people who have civil union partners. Well, I take yeah. it back, sorry. Yeah, Thank they you. didn't, they didn't go the extra step. Okay. That's you. why we still have it there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I thought about that too. And so I checked yeah. that. I guess I think it's fine. I agree. So how do we want to do this there? I think there are some things that are going to be harder to tackle, like gift and conflict of interest. I have a couple other smaller things that I don't think are going to take a lot of conversation, but I just wanted clarity on them. One was the advisory opinion on page six, line seven. And I have to admit, I don't remember the terms, but um, where am I? Page six, line seven. A, a oh, no, yeah, line seven. Huh? A beginning, a public servant may request either guidance or an advisory opinion. Yeah, my understanding was that um, the way we did this is if I call you, Christina, and say, I don't know if this would be a conflict of interest, and so I'm just checking it out with you. Can you give me some advice? You would tell me, I mean, it isn't legal advice or anything, but you would say, you might want to think about that, and you should da 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 da. If, and I don't remember what that was called, and then if 14 people ask you the same thing, then you can write an advisory and that advisory is public and just says, this seems to be an area where people are concerned about, um, about this. And so we're advising you that you, you might uh, do this in these circumstances. So I'm confused about how, why we used guidance or an advisory opinion in this um, place. Sure, I can clarify. So individuals can ask for guidance or for an advisory opinion. So the difference is that the guidance will always be confidential as long as the person requesting it wants it to remain so. An advisory opinion will be posted publicly on the website, but with personally identifying information redacted. And then the other scenario um, that you suggested, which is when the commission would proactively issue an advisory opinion, that would be in response to like a current issue or if we're getting similar questions over and over again, and we thought it was prudent to do so. Okay, so, but they're both called advisory opinions. Um, yes, so okay. you can ask for guidance or an advisory opinion. Okay, so then I, I'm, I'm okay with that then. I just needed some clarification on that because I couldn't remember it. Well, why would I ask for an advisory opinion? Wouldn't I always ask for guidance? Why would I want it posted? I mean, it depends on the scenario. You might, you might think that the public would benefit from knowing the answer. So okay. yeah, it's up to the individual. I mean, in, in those cases, so you're asking about your own perspective 
conduct. So if your personal identifying information isn't going to be included, it might be something where you're like, I think this is an important issue and you want it to be available to the public. Okay. All right. So uh, I think the next thing that I had on my list, I, and I, if, if, if you have other ideas of the way we should be doing this, please let me know because I, I don't want to be um, directing this necessarily or dominating it, but I think that the uh, definition of um, post point, where is that? Uh, page 11. And I know that I um, thought that those were pretty um, vague terms, but I also saw the, um, when you, Christine, when you sent out the, um, the HR, it, they use the, those exact same yes, terms. And, the judiciary. Sorry. and I didn't print out the judiciary one, but I really liked the judiciary definition, but I didn't print it out because it was uh, 42 pages or some ridiculous yeah. thing. I mean, their whole, their whole um, policies. And I, I couldn't figure out how to print just that one little section. Did, any, did anybody else read that from the judiciary? Yeah. It, I'm embarrassed. Did they send it to one? I just haven't. No, seen Christina it. sent it to us. Oh, Chris, did you? Oh, I didn't, no. She sent us both the. Um, oh, here it is. It's also on our the web. It's right here on our website, which so we can look at it right now. And it was on page twenty eight, as I remember, and I didn't want to print out many many pages, but I. It's one hundred and ten pages. Okay. So what page are you directing us to? Twenty eight. I think it was. I think I looked. Uh, I think it was on page twenty eight. Took me or maybe fifty eight or something. It took me a long time to scroll down to it. If you look at the table of contents it'll tell you it's under co code of conduct or code of ethics should be 60 or 61 i think and i did cut Is out it? uh the portion and put it in the email that the portion that related to outside employment oh oh i didn't see that i'm sorry i i apologize i printed out the whole thing i, I mean i looked up the whole thing i didn't uh christina where are you Oh so my God. That is 58. Great. Can't do too many things here. Since, since 1.30, I have received 150 emails. About this? No, about other things, but none of them are the kind of news feeds and stuff that I get. They're all, no, not about this. I can't get. What time did you send it, Christina? I found it and now I lost it. Last night or early this morning, she sent us one. Okay. Morning. Anyway, I, I did like that, their definition. I thought it was. Um, I think it was at 12, 12. Was it 12 something? Yes. I received one from Christina at 2.25 p.m. Yep. Which, that's the which one. is titled Some Notes Attached. Yeah. Yep. That's the um, one, Anthony. Yeah. There is two. So there's one about outside employment, which I sent earlier, which I think is at 1212. And then there's one I sent uh, just before we started, which was about notes on conflict of interest. Right. right. Got it. Sorry Got about it. this. So one was Connecticut, one was Rhode Island. Uh, yes, that is that would be the the definitions in the codes of ethics in those states, and then I also sent around um, the definitions uh, for outside employment that are currently in the pol in the judiciary's policies as well as Vermont Human Resources policies. Yeah, I did get those. And those and were the the judicial branch one has A, B, C, and D. So it's hard to bounce back and forth. Which one do we want to address? Deal with first. Uh, let's deal with outside employment and look at how they define them. And HR defines it very similarly. They have they use exactly those same three words that that I had some concern about. 
um, judiciary does not, and I have lost your email. I clicked on it and it went completely away and it didn't go into deleted. I can resend it. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about this. So anybody have any contact comments given? Um, well, I like them both. I don't see any problem with the with the Vermont um, Human Resource Personnel Policy one either. It seems no. more con it's more condensed. It seems makes a better read. My concern is those three words, but which ones? Inconsistent, incompatible, or in conflict, and I particularly have concerns about that um, for those boards and commission members and legislators because HR already has the policy. So it's gonna be their policy regardless of what we put in here, right? That's, that is correct. And I've also checked in with them. And right now the understanding that I have with Tom Waldman is that this actually also applies to board members and commissioners. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, and who, who determines it for boards and commissions? Whether they're, it's inappropriate or, is that the appointing agency? Yep, sorry, it's just an email. Yeah, so whoever, it's already in place. And so I have to check the policy again, but I believe it's the appointing authority who would make that decision. So either in advance of the person being appointed or it comes up afterwards. But um, I am still on an ongoing conversation with Tom Waldman about it. So I can't really, you know, by memory, give you all the details, but I believe that's correct. Okay. I don't know what is happening to my email here, but whenever I click on an email from you, it goes nuts. Okay, uh, forget it. I, I'm not going to try and go there because it, oh, here it is. Oh, God. Oh, sorry, which of, of the many attachments are we looking at? I'm sorry, Oliver was leaving for Kansas City, so I had to say goodbye. What? I, I'm lost, I'm, I'm afraid at the moment. Did you um, make sure that he didn't bring his little basket with him? <laughs> we would not uh, want him to be whisked off. Are his the little red shoes? No, nope. yeah. everything. He's going to tell me how up to date everything is in Kansas City. Okay, you know they've gone about as long as he doesn't come back with Omicron, we're okay. Okay, but wait. Sorry, are we on the something with judiciary? Not with judiciary. Are we? Which of Christina's many uh, helpful things that we're looking at? Right. Well, so she sent us the Vermont HR personnel policy and procedure. And number three has uh, employees shall not engage in any employment activity or enterprise. It's just been determined by appointing authority. So that would be the appointing authority for the boards and commissions to be inconsistent, incompatible, or in conflict with their duties. The, um, and then the judiciary says, shall not engage in any employment activity or enterprise which may be determined by the employer supervisor incompatible or in conflict. I guess they're pretty much the same, aren't they? Those are probably terms that are used. So I'm gonna I'm gonna drop my <laughs> I yeah. I'm Those are gonna that say would... we're okay. I'm okay. Yeah. Those are pretty one. Huh? You're okay with which? Okay well with I'm okay what? with the one that's in here. In the, in the in the draft bill. One that's in the bill. Oh, okay. Because it's. I was just going to point out something. This may be. I may be wrong about this, but the the state one says employees shall not engage in any employment activity. Right. And it says or in conflict with the duties as a state employee. So if I'm on a board or commission, I'm not necessarily an employee. I'm just a volunteer on a commission. I I can say um, there's a section above that says who it applies to. And so it says it applies to appointees and then I didn't include it, but if you refer back to the definition, the classifications of employees, appointees include board members, commissioners, uh, members of councils. And so that okay. is something that's actually just chatting with about with Tom Waldman about earlier. So I'm gonna follow up with him, but that was also his understanding 
that they would fall under the category of appointees and be covered by this section. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm sorry to belabor that point. I just didn't like those three words, but everybody seems to use it. And Tom told us that it's very common everywhere else. So I'm fine with them. So if I'm um, correct, we really have uh, two major issues left that um, we have concern over. One is the conflict of interest and one is the gifts. Yep. Yeah, we. And um, I'm gonna suggest that we start with the gifts only because I've had more time to think about that than conflict of interest. So this is very selfish of me. If anybody else would like to start with the conflict of interest, I'm fine with that. Doesn't matter, we gotta do them both anyway. Yeah, and you're driving the bus. Well, I'm fine with it. Yeah, that's a little dangerous. Um, but before we leave Christina's emails, uh, Christina, did you were, were one of your attachments on gifts? I don't remember. I don't. No, they were not. No, I didn't think. So. Yeah, as I recall. Okay, great. So we can go back to the bill. So I, I, um, on page two, I would not use the definition of gift there because that is the that is the lobbying that is under. Um, campaign finance, I mean, under the lobbying statute. And that really applies to, to legislators, I believe. Um, it's under the, um, as I remember it, it is, um, and, and, and I don't, and it says political contributions, anything less than adequate compensation travel, I think we should not use that as a definition, but in fact, we should just under the code of ethics in number, whatever it is, 10 or whatever number deals with gifts is just- Nine, it's on page nine and it's number nine. It's just define what we mean by gift and what we don't mean by gift instead of using that definition at all. Because I, th I think it's confusing um, because it really is under, I looked it up and I don't remember now, but I think it is clearly under the um, legislative um, definitions of gift for, from lobbyists. And well, I don't think that, that I, I think we should just have our own, we're gonna be, legislators are gonna be covered by that definition anyway, regardless of what we do with gifts here, they're gonna be covered by that. But I don't know that. You think the gifts on page nine are, are relate back to just- No, no, if you look just at the definition of gifts on page two under definitions, right. it says it has the same meaning as, as two BSEA two sixty one, which is the lobbying section of the right. Um, but can it, can Amron read that to us because we don't have it in front of us? Yes, I can read that to you. Because because the definition on page nine, I, I think most of those are pretty good. Well, read the. Yeah, but I'd love to hear from Amron about the lobbyist definition. Yes. And, and the headings, where it's under also, not just the definition. Right. Amron, please. Um, the heading, okay. So this is within Title II, uh, Legislature, Chapter 11, Registration of Lobbyists, uh, Section 261, which is entitled Definitions. Um, GIFT is under Subdivision 6. 6A, gift means a political contribution. Uh, that was number one. Two, anything of valuable, 
Anything of value, tangible or intangible, that is bestowed for less than adequate consideration, including travel expenses, such as travel fare, room and board, and other expenses associated with travel. Three, a meal ticket or alcoholic beverage. Four, a ticket, fee, or expenses for or to any sporting, recreational, or entertainment event. Five, a speaking fee or honorarium, except actual and reasonable travel expenses. Six, a loan made on terms more favorable than those made generally available to the public in the normal course of business. And then subdivision B, the uh, gift does not mean, one, anything given between immediate family members, two, printed education materials such as books, reports, pamphlets, or periodicals, three, a gift which is not used and which within 30 days after receipt is returned to the donor or for which the donor is reimbursed for its fair market value and uh, for a, dev a devise or inheritance. So my concern with that is that that, is, that applies to legislators. That's under the lobbyist thing for legislators. We will be held to that standard, whether we use it in this in the state code of ethics that applies to everybody or not. And even if we aren't covered under the state code of ethics, we will be held to that because that's the current law. So my, my problem in using that here is that I think we should just put our own definition of gift in here so that it's clear instead of using that and then having a kind of another definition and then exemptions from definitions. That's, it's mainly for clarity and because I don't know why we would care what applies to lobbying efforts for legislators in this. I agree. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I guess I'm it, not sure either. It depends on no, what new definition Allison, we Anthony is, Anthony was talking. Well, I just say I'm not sure because I'm not sure what new definition we would come up with. The definition that Amron read, which I know has really to, you know, to lobbyist gifts, seemed like not a bad definition to me, but I'm not sure if we came up with something better, I'm not opposed to doing that. No, I'm not saying that we shouldn't use, maybe even use that definition, but not refer back to that because that's under the legislative lobbyist section of law and right. nobody boards and commissions don't care if they looked at that and they said why would we be subject to that we can put this in a definition but i don't think we should we should refer, refer. to that that's all that's all i'm saying sure that's, that's makes sense tj is a stand-up i think by the yeah, way okay tj yeah i, I apologize I, I just um the way that most states have done uh, dealt with this and this is this is hotly discussed and, and bandied over over years in most states. The, the most successful provisions I've seen in terms of clarity, um, not just for the drafters, but for uh, government officials, is to have an omnibus de definition of gift. You know, that it's something like anything of value for which uh, full consideration isn't given and then have specific carve outs, which may number, you know, in, in the dozens. But to, and that provides anybody who's reading it with clarity as to what falls outside of gift and everything else falls within. Um, but that's, and, and again, states, I think Connecticut has like 30 exceptions to their gift statute, which may, which may be too many, but you often come up with about a dozen of the same uh, definition, anything under $20, any. But what it allows people to do is they can read it and very clearly see that it's either one of the exceptions or it's a gift. And it also makes ease in, in a, an amendment. And you will amend it. I, I, my, at least that's my guess, because most states do. They, they get into uh, actually parsing it out and they say, you know, we really don't mean to have whatever it is be a gift. So let's add that as another exemption. Uh, from what gift is. So if, if I can um, read the UVM definition of, uh, kind, and again, this was part of the thing that I wasn't looking for this, but it was what I printed out last night. No trustee shall solicit or accept from any person. And then because they 
don't have person in the same definition. They say organization, corporation, or other legal entity seeking to do, seeking to do or doing business with or otherwise gain benefit from the university um, shall not accept for including gift, gravity, gratuity services, loans, travel, entertainment, or other considerations of more than additional value, normal, nominal value in exchange for a promise or reasonable inference that the trustee's influence with the university has been in exchange for such consideration. I mean, it, it very clearly says you can't, you can't um, accept a gift that is meant anything outside of nominal um, value in exchange for a promise to do something or an implied promise to do something. And I think that's kind of where we want to go. And then we have the exceptions, like you said, underneath that, that um, a gift is not a gift from um, mom to son, even though son works for um, the Public Utilities Commission and mom owns Green Mountain Power. I mean, so I, I, I don't know, but that's, it seems to me that's the direction we wanna go is we wanna do what TJ just said is have a, a definition. And then if there are exemptions and that we put those in. I, I think yep. that's a good way to go. Ben, I did like you it. have a? I was just gonna, um... For the record, Ben Tinsley campaign for Vermont. Um, I was just going to agree with what um, where you where you're going with that. Um, I, I in the research that we've done, um, it does seem like the the most clear definitions of gifts are ones that say anything of monetary value, except for basically what that lobbying um, definition was doing and saying, you know, except for educational materials or gifts between family members. Um, that are clearly, you know, uh, due to a, a personal relationship, um, something like that. So th that does seem like the cleanest route to go is like here and the gift is anything of value except for like these specific things um, aren't counted in that definition. And it also doesn't mention the dollar amount. The, which uh, I think is good. I think avoiding a dollar amount makes sense because it's like, $10 today is not $10 next year. You know, it just mm -hmm. seems like it's hard to deal with the dollar amount. The example that uh, we've seen of this is like, you know, usually the term is of a, a de minimis nature. So the example yeah. I often see of that de minimis nature um, is, uh, you know, you can take a, a legislator out and have a cup of coffee, right? So mm -hmm. you, most, most states will allow you to do that. Um, you can buy a legislator a cup of coffee, but anything more than that, you know, you take them out for a steak dinner and, you know, you get a bottle of wine like that is, you know, that's what we're trying to, that's the line. It's like cup of coffee. Great. Do that. Anything more than that. That's where we start getting into dangerous territory. A lot of the uh, lobbyists here by um, Boone farm. So I think that's under, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I, I am, I am sorry about that, but so the, I, I like the, um, idea of not even defining the, the $20 or the $15 or whatever, but I will tell you that legislators will still have that amount because it is in our lobbying statutes. So even if everybody, so regardless of what we do here, legislators, are going to still be held to that twenty dollar. Um, if Ben takes me for a cup of coffee, that's fine. But if he buys me breakfast at the same time and it's more than twenty dollars, then he has to report it. So that's problem. part of our our campaign finance sure. law. Problem with that is that in a year or two, twenty dollars is barely going to cover a cup of coffee. <laughs> Very possible. I, I know. Uh, that's why. That's why we go to Ma's Diner instead of Starbucks right. for coffee, where it's still a dollar. But the um, so I but I I just want to remind us that even if we don't put an amount in here, we will still under our campaign finance law be sure. covered by the amount that's in there. Am I right about that, Ben? 
Yes, that, that is true. This doesn't negate the, um, the definition. And really the, the definition, I actually kind of agree with the way that this is confusing because the definition is supposed to apply to lobbyists um, who are uh, giving gifts to legislators. So it's sort of like the other way around from what we're talking about in some ways. Um, so I think that I don't disagree that it would be helpful here to have a separate definition that's very clear because having that definition for you know, that was written with lobbyists in mind would be confusing when you start talking about state employees and boards and commissions and these, these other scenarios. So I don't disagree with the approach. Um, and I think there is a way to make it pretty clear following, um, you know, basically the intent of what that existing statute is trying to do. So just to remind me, the, the, the one in campaign finance one does have a $20 limit? It does. I think it, yes, I think it does. And so even if like when when um, Blue Cross Blue Shield puts on their legislative night, okay, they don't do it anymore because we're all <laughs> remote. Yeah. But this, if if they serve, um, if they have shrimp and all really wonderful things, and they figure that for each person who um, comes, it's over that amount, they have to list it on our donation right. list, yep. and that's why we sign in when we go to places. Yeah, that is, is that's exactly right. There is a, yeah. uh, um, a, a piece in there too, where if a, it's a large enough event where there's more than I think 20 or 50 legislators involved, like there's a there's a exemption for that. But yes, that is why they have you do that. I think Pat had a comment. Thank you, Ben. You're muted. She's looking. Ta-da. Sorry about that. For the record, Pat McDonald. Um, I was thinking about when employees, state employees like myself, would go to conferences and there would be a big event sponsored by, I don't know, 3M, IBM, whatever. Um, some states, as long as it was open to everybody, would allow us to go. Other states, like Pennsylvania, if it was sponsored by a lobbyist, you were out of luck. You couldn't go have the shrimp and, and all the stuff. And, and mm -hmm. I've never seen that printed anywhere. And I've always wanted as a backup to, to say, yes, we were right in our interpretation that if you went to an open event, um, that it was okay. Cause they weren't singling out me to right. now that you talk to me at the event, that's for sure. But they weren't singling me out for the dinner uh, or you know, to talk to Vermont to get something done. Yeah. So, I, but I've never seen that in print anywhere, and I, I don't know whether it's a good thing to confirm it someplace or just to. It, it may be someplace I've just never seen it. Well, that could be one of the exceptions here. Yep. Is that yep. um, state employees, board, and commission members and stuff can, if if there's a something like that. I mean, that could. Yeah. Because yeah. Pennsylvania, if they saw IBM or anybody's name on it none of the employees who went to the conference could go, which was sort of a shame because you did miss out on, on talking to people and, and the, the benefit of being at a conference is being able to share ideas and meet other people from other states, but that's the way they did it. So that's it, sorry. But that could be. So uh, um, I don't know the best way to go about this, if we, maybe we can have Christina and TJ, if you're willing and Amarin, to try and <coughs> come with some language, um, try and put this together somehow reflecting what we've been talking about here. Um, and I, I would say feel free to reach out to Ben or Pat or anybody else who yeah, for um, sure. uh, has thoughts. I, I have, this is beyond me to try to, to um, wordsmith now, I mean, I think that what, if we have something that we can look at, then we can respond to that. Does that make sense, committee? Yeah. Is to put kind of this general language about about not taking anything um, for less than value, and then have the exemptions underneath. And I and I wouldn't put exemptions for legislators in there because we're already covered someplace else. We're already um, whether whether it's in here or not, we are covered. Yes, Allison. Well, 
I think the public will be reading this document and that should be articulated somewhere, Amarin, that we're covered elsewhere. You know, I just, I, I, I think if we're missing, people will have a problem with our being miss, our miss being missing from this document. But uh, I know this is small, but we've gone from some small things. Uh, what is the difference between de minimis and nominal? Because we're talking about nominal gifts, which are often de minimis, but nominal to one person is not the same as nominal to another person. Um, anyway, I'm just curious as we use, those are the two terms that are used other than a, a money amount of, of, of an exact figure. So I'd, I'd appreciate Amarin maybe looking at those definitions and making a suggestion when we next gather. Thanks. Yeah, I have no idea what, Amarin, did you? Um, no, I just <clears throat> wanted to make sure I understand the, the direction that you're, you're going with this. So uh, right now we would be taking out the current definition of gift as right. currently written, putting in something that is much broader, like a gift is anything of value, value tangible or intangible that is bestowed for less than adequate consideration, right? As just a broad definition. And then when you go down to the gift section, it would talk about exceptions, right? I don't know that you even need to put it in the definition section if it's just in gifts, because um, we don't define in the definition section, for example, we don't define um, uh, Yeah, I was imagining it would just be in the gift section. Huh? I was imagining it would just be in the gift section. Yeah, because we don't define outside employment in the definition section, and we don't define um, uh, uh, post-government employment or any of those things in the definition. So I, I don't think I would even put a definition in there i would just put it in the in the number nine or whatever number that is yeah and then you don't have to say legislators aren't are covered elsewhere i mean you could just identify what yeah, i don't I, think you have to say that i think if somebody has a question about it they could ask but i wouldn't i wouldn't mention legislators one way or the other i would just say no. this is how we define a gift right but I wouldn't put it in the definition section. Right. I would just no, I put it in the under in the gift section. Point Building number point. nine or whatever it is. Yeah, under nine. I think you're right. I don't know if that is right or not, but if we define gifts in the definition section, then it seems to me that we should also define um, employment restrictions or post post-government employment or outside employment, those terms, because those terms aren't defined somewhere. So that. You look um, skeptical, Amron. Who me? <laughs> I was just, I, it was occurring to me, maybe we should be thinking about if those need to be defined. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think so, because if we put them all in the definitions th that they're in the, th we right. would end they're up having to gifts. define, there are, t there are a lot of um, um, terms in here that are used, and if we would have to define them all. I, I don't think we have to define all those things. Just state what they are, as we do on Page nine, under number yeah. nine. Okay. Let's so, do it that way, and then we can see if that satisfies. Okay, so if the, um, okay, okay. Okay, so, um, and I don't think we're going to have time today, unless you want to get into the conflict of interest one. Um, we can do it, but I... We'll go I back. Think, uh, Senator Clarkson had one kind of simple question, just as a clarification on line 11, um, I mean, page 11, lines 18 and 19, about the legislators post employment. And I believe that says that a legislator cannot be a lobbyist for one year after their term ends. 
Yep. That's the only one I'm aware of, but it, are there others that would be a pro? I guess it. I guess one of my questions is: Are there other? Are there other uh, post-employment things that would seem inappropriate? Or, I mean, that's the only one that's been that we've dealt with. But there may be others that we haven't thought about or that we just haven't addressed. For legislators for post-employment. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will tell you that I'm not going to go there because we are a citizen legislature. And if you're going to start telling me that when I'm done with my terms, I can't get a job someplace. Mm -mm. The, the yeah, legislative, no, I, huh? Yeah, no, I, I, I don't disagree. Maybe just leave it and let, but again, instead of referring, you could just easily say that you could. I mean, do you want to keep the reference or do you want to spell it out? I, I don't care one way or the other, but I don't want to expand it because I think that that's a, that's a, that's a problem. And if we start doing that, we are really tampering with the, our citizen legislature. Can I just- Senator read, Collimore? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. I'm just going to read what it says because I think I understand it. Except as permitted in subdivision four of this subdivision B, a former legislative branch employee shall not for one year after leaving state service be an advocate for anyone other than the state for compensation before the General Assembly or any of its subparts, et cetera, et cetera. So it doesn't completely prohibit no, that's the legislative branch employee. Read the one above it, the legislator. Oh, uh, sorry. Well, all it says is shall comply with the post government employee restrictions prescribed in Title II. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's what Allison is wondering what 2 okay. VSA 266 says. And, and it, it basically yeah. just says that for one year you can't yes. be a lobbyist. Yes. I ben, happen to you, have the book right here. Ben, did you have? Yeah, that is that is what it says. And that was part of the original um, ethics bill that was passed back in uh, 2017, included that definition of post employment um, restrictions for one year. And that that was a debate back then because there was some discussion about many states do two years. Um, we decided, I think, to do one year for Vermont. That seemed like a better balance, uh, again, because the citizen legislature piece that seemed like a better fit for Vermont. Um, there are other there are other post-employment restrictions um, across state government. For example, um, DFR, you, you can't, as a regulator, you can't go and work for a financial firm for a certain period. There's a cooling off period before you can do that. Um, you know, these types of post-employment um, uh, post restrictions are meant to address revolving door issues where, you know, regulators take jobs in um, industries that they regulated. That's usually right. the executive right. branch side of things, what we're looking to prevent. Um, that could be applicable in some cases to boards and commissions as well. I haven't read the definitions in this particular bill to see if that's the case, but you could think of like um, the first example that's popping into my head uh, could be uh, like the Green Mountain Care Board, for example. Um, someone went and took a job with a hospital they're regulating. Um, you know, we would we would likely expect them to have a cooling off period so they can't go right from board service into as a regulator into um, into employment. So the, there is some applicability there for boards and commissions as well. But I, I, I think that if we think about expanding this, we are dooming it to failure. At the beginning, yeah, I'm not necessarily. I don't. I don't know how this. I'd have to look at these definitions again yeah. in this bill to know if that's what's happening here. I'm just saying we shouldn't. That's something to keep in the back of your mind. Is like yeah. there are some situations where boards are regulators. And, oh no, I didn't mean there. I meant for legislators. Oh, I was. For yeah, yeah. No, Allison, I the definition is this. So I, I think I'm okay with this at the moment, but I think obviously we can revisit some of this and improve on it and for years to come. I think the boards and commissions is a, is a little interesting. We have examples of that, um, not legislators, but members of boards and commissions who have come into state government immediately after serving 
on a board and commission. It's uh, it's certainly something to think about, but I think for out years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, and I, I wouldn't necessarily be worried about them taking a mm -hmm. position within state government after serving on a board. And it's more of an issue, I think, if they are on a on a commission that is a regulatory commission. Yeah, and, and then go. Yeah. And then go and take a job at a, at a business or organization that they are regulating. That would be more of a concern. Yeah. And the executive yellow. office. Yeah. Go ahead. Executive officers are prohibited from doing that. Executive officers are. Yeah. Yeah. Or, um, yeah. Okay. Um, where are we, committee? I think um, we're good to go, but I would save conflict of interest. I have a 430 meeting. So I would, uh, I would love to save conflict of interest, which I think is a big conversation. So let's, um, maybe we can, um, I would love to get this done with, <laughs> as I think we all would. Um, maybe uh, look at next week. Amarin, is that possible for you to get um, what we've talked about today? in a form by the end of next week? Yes. Okay, and then we can take on the conflict of interest issue. And in the meantime, um, we should maybe just do some research on, on our own about different um, places where they have conflict of interest and how they define it and, and what it means and, and stuff so that we can, um, and Christina and T TJ, if you have anything yeah. Send it to us and the same with Pat and Ben. Um, Pat? You're muted, Pat. I'm trying to be a good doobie here because um, I have all kinds of things going on. So anyway, you, you didn't mention boards and commissions and that is something I'd like to be yeah. invited back to talk about just to add to the all the stuff you've got to do already. Yeah, I think that that's another conversation that we need to have. We'll try and address mm -hmm. that again um, next time also about and what it means and and I'm not sure if um, I, I, we will say I'll send um, a note to Kendall um, about that I'm not sure that I'm not sure who took Jason Malucci's um, position with the um, on the boards and commissions but and he did it for such a long time that maybe he would be willing to even come and talk to us about, about kind of their screening process and how they do it and some of the issues are involved in it. Does that make any sense? Yeah, that's a good idea. All right, anything, uh, Christina? Yeah, so I just want to circle back to gifts and clarify when we're talking about removing the dollar amount, is that just from the definition? Or are we still going to have it um, under an exception? Because I do think there would be a downside to removing having a determined dollar amount, then maybe we could come up with some pros and cons and put it on the table for next time as well. Yeah, I would I would say <coughs> I'm not sure if how it should be, but um, and I wouldn't have anything in the definitions at all. And then um, under here so you have gift exceptions or um i would make it a little bit clearer than it is in here but um how however it gets um uh defined and then what the exceptions are and then we'll um address them because i i don't know at this point and i don't know what the committee what we think okay I, yeah I don't know about putting a dollar amount on it. I really, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know either. I don't know, and I don't know what the dollar amount should be. Um, okay, can I tell you a, a really funny something that, and I hope nobody misinterprets this, but. Um, so a, a long time ago, I was working with Paul Burns on something and he, uh, his wife was pregnant at the time and they had a Vermont day up in the state house cafeteria and Putney winery was up there. And I said, Oh, you should get some, this is really good. This is really good stuff. You should get some. And he said, Oh, well, my wife can't 
drink alcohol now because she's, and I said, oh, well, they have a nice bubbly that's non-alcoholic. So I brought him up a bottle of it the next time I went home and I gave it to him and he made some comment about um, uh, looking some something that people might look askance. And I said, oh, I guess I misunder misunderstood it. I you're supposed to be giving me the gifts, not me giving you the gifts. It was it was quite um, funny at the time. And I just keep thinking about that silly little bottle of bubbly that could have gotten me in trouble had he given it to me. <laughs> um, any uh, more questions or comments before we or anything else that we should be looking at? Conflict of interest boards and commissions. Yes, TJ. Would it benefit uh, the process to just sort of lay out some of the concerns about the conflict of interest uh, provision? Not to try to resolve oh. them today, but just. Oh. Uh, oh, sure, sure. To help, to help going, you guys going forward. Um, sure. Uh, <laughs> Brian um, knows about my my paper. Um, horrible. Um, inability to keep my papers. Okay. I, uh, I think uh, here's some of my concerns and other people um, jump in with concerns. I think that um, first of all, the, uh, there isn't really a, a definition of conflict of interest is I can't remember. Is that in the definitions? Yeah, it's on page two. It uh, right. Page two. What does it say? I can't. Means an interest, direct or indirect, oh, yeah. or otherwise, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, of a public servant, or such an interest known to the public servant of a member of the public servant's immediate family or household or business associate. Yeah. In the outcome of a particular matter pending before the public servant or the public service public body, or that is in conflict with the proper discharge of the public servant's duties, conflict of interest does not include any interest that is of no greater than that of other persons generally affected by the outcome of a matter, such as a policyholder in the insurance company or a depositor in a bank. Yeah, and I, I don't know, it seems like a really dense um definition to me. I don't know that I have particular concerns about the definition, but I do have a concern that um, it, uh, it impacts all boards and commissions here. And I think that is a concern that I have because um, we have thir almost 3,200 people in Vermont that are on boards and commissions. And some of them really, there are different levels of boards. There are some that are simply advisory. There are some that just get together and hear reports. Um, and and I, I, so I fear that because this applies to all boards and commissions, that that is over, uh, an, a definition that's too, too broad. And then when you go to course of action, I, I think that that also is um, really too broad. That's on page six um, in terms of asking people to um, write small, to ask a, a board member a, uh, of a small board to ask them to m write this statement about why, why they, um, why they should be allowed to go forward. I, I just, um, the, and, and so that, that's my concern is some of that. I think it's too um, cumbersome, cumbersome for many of the people that serve. I, um, I mean, the, the, this is a pretty, um, extensive well it wouldn't have to be it could be one sentence but 
and so then um, you you do that. I mean, there's um, like eleven. Uh, there's 22 lines of stuff that you're supposed to address in your explanation here. Um, so. Yeah, I agree. We have to pare that down somehow. I'm thinking of a cemetery commission of board or something. I mean, I. I well, they wouldn't be affected because they're a municipal. But okay. but the uh, um, some of the boards and commissions that we've been looking at in the Sunset um, Advisory Committee, right? They don't have any power. They um, they're some they might be advisory, but so I think that that's um, and even for um, an employee, I guess to. If you um, if something comes up and I'm and I'm I'm not the other thing that we really need to talk about is whether this applies to legislators or not. But if it should apply to legislators, this this I'm not going to write these all down. <laughs> when I I'm just going to stand up and say, excuse me, under um, Rule seventy three, I might have a conflict, um, and. The General Assembly, the Senate is going to decide whether I have a conflict or not, and whether I should recuse myself, and that's the end of it. I'm not going to write down all these things saying why I should yeah. be allowed to continue. That's up to the other senators to let me or not. So, so if this doesn't apply to the General Assembly, then it's less important in that aspect, but I think it is important for our boards and commissions and even even some state employees that um, might have a conflict to have to write all this down and then anyway, Ben. Madam yeah. Madam Chair, sorry, I just have to excuse myself. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Bye. Thank you. Um, just one one quick thought to leave you. I know we don't want to get too far into this today, um, and and nor should we, because uh, we should give it give the appropriate amount of time to, to discuss it. Um, one thought I would leave you with is, as currently written, this would this gives um, uh, persons who have a potential conflict of interest, as defined, um, the option to a recuse themselves from a vote that is an action they can take themselves to to just say nope I think I have a conflict here I'm done that puts them in compliance with the code um the option number two is to say I might have the appearance of a conflict but I don't actually think I'm conflicted here um and uh and in that case provide that explanation and there's that you know 21 lines of like here's what here's guidance for what should be in that um that explanation i think really what we're what most people will be looking for is like this should be a one page like here's why it might look like i have a conflict but my conflict is really de minimis in nature and here's why that that's sort of what it's getting at i think and christina i don't know what your is, is that consistent with your understanding as well yeah i agree I, I don't think it's really looking for a book it's just covering the main points and having it written down somewhere as a reference and so I don't know, maybe it would be helpful if we come up with an example for next time to review of what it might look like in reality. Yeah, okay. yeah. That would be good. Yeah. And I'll just, uh, going back to the point earlier about the definition of conflict of interest, it is possible that the boards and commissions are already covered by this definition because in the executive code of ethics actually uses this exact definition. And so depending how, if appointee is defined the same way as it is in the Vermont Human Resources um, policies and procedures, it is possible that all of them or a majority of them are already subject to that definition. So it might be mm -hmm. worth following up to see where there's overlap and if it's 100% overlap because it might end up being a moot point. Okay, good, good thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, <clears throat> other than that, um, any other thoughts? I'm all thought out. <laughs> Me too. Tomorrow you'll be all thought out. <laughs> really? <laughs> or maybe not. Or maybe not. Isn't it supposed to get really cold tonight? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Can I put Title II back on the shelf now? 
<laughs> yes. <laughs> thank you. And um, everybody, thank you for your indulgence um, on some of these things. I just, um, I think that this is a really important thing to do and to get done and want to make sure that we do it in a manner that both um, gives the public confidence that people, that our government employees and officials are acting in the best faith um, and, that, and that also doesn't make it so burdensome for those people who are those employees and officials and and doesn't um, and given the fact that we are such a small state, doesn't um, uh, th there was a con a potential conflict of interest uh, with the VPIC board at one point, and it just seemed so silly. But because of the definition, um, it meant that somebody couldn't take a job as a school teacher. Um, somebody's son couldn't take a job as a school teacher because VPIC covers the investments of the teacher's retirement system. And, and we are such a small state that, that there's always going to be overlap. So I think that that's, it's important to get this balanced right. And we want to do it in such a way that we can make sure that it, it um, meets the straight face test and passes uh, um, the Senate and the House. Right. So, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.